fifth year in a, in a row that I uh, present about the PV market, but this year it's going to be a, a little different because we went a bit uh, over the scope of the usual evolution. In fact, the, uh, the market, the PV market in Canada has grown tremendously in the last couple of years. And so to make sure that our uh, information base uh, upon which we base uh, policy decisions, investment decisions, so to make sure that this information base is updated and up to date, we commissioned a report from uh, Navigant, who is a consulting firm, well-known consulting firm in the field of uh, photovoltaics, to develop a uh, photovoltaic sector profile of the, the, the state of the market as it is uh, today. And actually, the, the report is, is this one here. We, uh, it's available. We released it uh, last Monday, so just uh, last Monday. It's available from our website. At the end, I'll be uh, giving uh, the, uh, the address where you can uh, download the PDF. But uh, for now, you'll have the, uh, the uh, PowerPoint version of it. So <coughs> the, the, the report covers the, the following uh, aspects. The market in Canada, uh, what are the incentives in the different provinces that foster the uh, deployment of the technology? It looks at the who makes what in, in Canada throughout the supply chain, so important uh, key knowledge for uh, investors. And also, it, it goes over the current economic and productivity statistics to have an idea of the importance of the market and the number of jobs, the uh, amount of uh, revenues it generates per year. And uh, also, it looks at the workforce assessment, how many jobs, how many jobs will we need in the near future. And finally, most importantly, it ends with the PV innovation system in Canada. We have the conventional technologies in place, but if we want to keep on going towards grid parity, there needs to be innovation. We need to uh, poise our uh, industry uh, in a position that they are able to export. So there's also a chapter on the PV innovation system. So <clears throat> if I just give a bit of background, I mean, Raphael might have seen this, uh, this introduction for the last five years, but it's not the same case for all of you. Hey, if I start, I mean, uh, traditionally, the, the, the market in, for PV in Canada has been in the off-grid application. So in the 90s already there, uh, I mean, the electricity was generated by diesel engine, and sometimes it can be very uh, expensive to carry diesel fuel in uh, remote locations like uh, close to telecommunication stations and also for uh, remote communities. So in those cases, uh, applications, photovoltaics was simply cost effective. It has been since the 90s and since then the, with the oil price increasing, it's even more uh, cost effective. Now as the price of photovoltaics came down year after year, we saw the applications get closer to the urban centers and that's why today uh, you can find uh, some uh, park meters are powered by PV and the big C system in Ottawa is powered by PV because it's less, it's, it's cheaper to simply add, let's say, a 20 watt PV module to a, a, um, a park meter that doesn't use that much energy anyway and has a battery uh, integrated. It's cheaper to do this than to uh, uh, dig in the infrastructure and get everything uh, hooked together. So for this reason, we find PV closer to us in the cities and also along the road for uh, signs and other standalone applications. But to, to tell the truth, I mean, most of the market eh, is within the grid-connected application because that's where most people live. That's where PV can uh, make the largest impact. And if we look at it, okay, there's a central application on, on the central North American grid, and also applications for uh, remote communities in the north that don't have access to the central grid, but that are nevertheless linked to each other through a local uh, uh, remote grid, isolated application. So in these cases, there's three types. There's the building integrated uh, PV to a house. Typically, the, the size of these systems will be between one to 10 kilowatts. An international average is about four kilowatts per system. Then you can also integrate it on top of a commercial institutional building. Typically, the applications will be will start at 20 kilowatts and go towards even one megawatt for very large systems, like uh, on the Munich uh, Trade Fair uh, building. But in Canada, they will be around 100 to uh, 500 kilowatts in general. And then finally, the largest application, which is, has only uh, recently entered the, the market in Canada, is the centralized uh, PV plant. 
and uh, typically that's for application starting at one megawatt and going uh, above uh, in Canada it's by units of 10 megawatts because the, the program is, is made like this, the incentive program. So if we see some examples, okay, we saw this morning, I'll uh, show the picture of the Sarnia solar system, 80 megawatt AC. So um, it was the largest PV system in the world at least until uh, up to the 2010. But because I wasn't sure if it was still the, the largest in the world, because uh, the US are developing some, China are developing, uh, Germany as well. So I know it's the largest plant in Canada. So we'll put it uh, like this. It was uh, designed and built by First Solar and owned by Enbridge. Consists of 1.3 million First Solar uh, Canadian Telluride PV modules and uses Canadian SATCOM inverters. So it's total area is close to one square kilometer. And it required an investment of uh, $4 million by Enbridge. Reconstruction, it uh, created 800 jobs. And in the summer, it's uh, enough, on an annual basis actually, to power more than 10,000 homes. So that gives a, a, good, uh, a, good, you know, a good example of uh, how much you can generate within a square, one square kilometer. Uh, as you see now, there's some clouds going over the uh, power station, and of course clouds will uh, change the amount of the power that gets uh, generated. And that's actually an issue of interest right now from the utilities, and there, this can cause uh, fluctuations of voltage, and that's uh, now uh, an issue that uh, we are uh, investigating with other partners, how the, the variability in, in sunshine affects the, the network. Um, a nice example of a building integrated systems outside Ontario, that's one of the larger ones, 108 kilowatt PV system installed on the federal uh, public works and government services at uh, uh, Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. So that system consists of uh, 500 modules from uh, Sanyo uh, HIT, so a heterojunction technology, half amorphous, half crystalline. And uh, typically over a year, over a year, this system generates about 10% of the electricity need uh, of the building. Now, integrating PV to, uh, to houses make uh, a lot of sense. Uh, there's many advantages. Well, what you see there is the uh, a picture of the Ecoterra house, which is one of the two net zero energy uh, homes that have been built through the uh, CMHC equilibrium uh, 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 project program uh, a couple of years ago. So that system, in theory, generates as much energy as it uses during uh, the period of the year. It has a, a three kilowatt uh, amorphous silicon building integrated uh, system. And when the integration is very well done, like in this case, uh, what's nice about it is that it can maximize the solar resource utilization because it re not only does it generate electricity, but it also recuperates some of the heat uh, generated by the module that would otherwise be lost, as lost to the uh, outside. Now some uh, fresh air can go underneath the, the module, recuperate part of the heat, up to three times what's generated in terms of electricity. And this is then sent into the, uh, uh, either to in the house, either to uh, dry clothing or to store in, the, uh, uh, in a slab, in a concrete slab to store the, the, the heat or used to uh, preheat uh, water. So uh, in addition to these functions, then when it's building integrated, the, the system can do two purposes, generate electricity, and also serve as building cladding. So at the moment, typically, building integrated the systems cost more because they require more fancy modules that uh, end up uh, being more expensive. But in the future, as we get uh, better and better at reducing the cost and integrating this in a product, uh, uh, more nicely, then we can expect that at some point the module will become part of the building cladding and thus will displace part of the cost associated to the building itself. Uh, also, I mean, compared to a structure that's ground mounted, there's uh, no additional cost for land uh, and less cost, I would say, for support structures. Uh, in a case like this, you know, the module is fully integrated on the roof, but sometimes when it's building applied, like it typically is, the module is installed on, on rail systems on the roof, and then you need to uh, add a bit of cost for the uh, uh, racking system. But nevertheless, the cost is less than for ground mounted. 
Now, since the building is uh, is uh, connected to the grid, okay, it doesn't require battery. It's not like a living off grid. And when you eliminate battery, first of all, you uh, eliminate their environmental impacts, but also the uh, maintenance of the ba the batteries, and also the extra cost associated to the battery. So, so really, the, the grid is our battery. When there is a surplus electricity generated in the summer, it is sent back to the grid. And then in Quebec, the house gets a, a credit that's then deducted from the energy bill at the end of the year. Also, since the electricity is generated where it is used, there's no distribution losses like you would get, let's say, if you have a PV farm or a large uh, uh, nuclear plant somewhere, you need to carry electricity. So there's many advantages. And it, uh, in short, it makes sense to integrate PV into a building. <coughs> now, let's look at the evolution of uh, this market uh, throughout the years. Uh, as I was mentioning, eh, the photovoltaics was mainly used in the 90s to power off-grid applications. And it's a, it's a self-sustaining <coughs> market. It's been growing at about 25% uh, per year for the last uh, 16 years. And it's still, uh, outside Ontario, it's still the main market uh, in Canada. However, starting in 2008-2009, with the advent of incentive programs, we started uh, seeing more uh, installations for grid connected. So grid connected in this, in this case is refers to buildings or to houses equipped with uh, PV systems. So we saw more and more applications. And actually last year, in 2011, there, was, uh, there were 295 megawatts uh, PV installed. So the grid connected capacity as of December 2011 stood at 495 megawatts. And that's really a, an explosive growth. I mean, just a couple of years ago, uh, it was growing only by a few megawatts each year. If you look in 2009, we almost uh, tripled the install capacity. In 2010, the, install p the capacity was again tripled. And now this year, we pretty much doubled the uh, install capacity in Canada. So there is a, a phenomenal growth at the moment uh, in Canada, mainly Ontario. And that's, of course, because of the uh, fill-in tariff program, the micro -crit program. And before that was the uh, resub program that uh, basically uh, offered to purchase all the f solar photovoltaic generated electricity uh, generated by uh, different plants. Uh, if it's Let's say megawatt plants, electricity is purchased for 20 years, over 20 years, at 44.3 cents per kilowatt hour. For large buildings like we've seen a couple of pictures ago, at about 63.5 kilowatt hours, uh, cents per kilowatt hours. And finally, for uh, residences, uh, houses, it's sold at uh, 80.2 uh, cents per kilowatt hour. Now, to, um, I would say, stimulate the industry to decrease their costs year after year. Often, uh, fill-in tariff mechanisms will uh, incorporate a, a tariff review. After a number of years, these tariffs are decreased so that it ensures the uh, sustainability of the program and also the best value for the taxpayer. So right now, I think there was some review initiated in December. And uh, what's recommended in terms uh, of uh, uh, new tariffs is now 34.7 cents for large uh, systems megawatt scale system, and then 50, about 54 cents per kilowatt hours for a, a large building, and 50, about 55 cents per kilowatt hours for homeowners. And so it's typically a reduction between 30% and 21% in the, in the tariff. And really, that's, that's warranted because when we look at the cost evolution year after year, our program has been uh, monitoring cost of the PV modules and systems for the last 15 years. And when we look at the evolution, just the modules themselves, this is the uh, re average, weighted average of the retail cost of PV modules. And this morning there were some cost numbers uh, that were uh, mentioned, but that I believe those were the fabrication costs or the distribution. Now what we're talking is what you, you the Canadian cons uh, consumer will pay if it goes to uh, uh, the, the retailer price. And that cost has been increased by 84% since 2001. In December 2011, it stood at about $1.51. And the projections for next year is to be close to about a dollar per watt. So these, uh, traditionally, the, the reductions were about 11% per year. 
but uh, recently um, with uh, China uh, uh, entering the production and having uh, large, very large uh, fabrication plants, uh, it put a lot of uh, pressure downward on the prices. And we've seen these uh, cost decrease accelerate even more, 31% and 32% in the last uh, two years on average. Question? What happened in 2006? Yes, I know there was a rule. Where we heard about uh, some rule that uh, the price of PV modules never go down. Uh, I wish that were true. It's generally true. Uh, in 2006, there was a bottleneck in terms of a, a crystalline silicon supply. Silicon, there's more than enough on the on Earth, but in, in this form of crystalline silicon, uh, there was a lot of, uh, of demand due to incentive programs everywhere around the world, and there was not enough crystalline silicon to meet the demand. And thus, the, the price of the PV modules went up for a, for a year, but then the more uh, production capacity, capacity was put online, and that uh, is the cost decrease uh, reason afterwards. So, so the, the, the model used to be about, to represent about half the cost of a PV system. It's not the case anymore, meaning that uh, the, the, we've been uh, better at decreasing the cost of PV modules than the rest, the balance of system cost, the installation, and, and the red tape. So there needs to be improvement in, in those areas. Uh, depending on the size of the system, if we were talking about a megawatt system, uh, last year the average price was about $3.50 per watt for megawatt scale uh, projects. And then for residential uh, projects, the average was about uh, $6 per watt. Now, <coughs> um, when we look at the, the, the picture of Canada and how many uh, installations are uh, actually online, uh, in Canada, really the, the impact of the Ontario uh, Power Authority Resource Fit and Microfit program is, uh, is really sets apart Ontario from the rest of Canada. Uh, at, at the moment, 99% of the, of the uh, grid connected capacity is installed in Ontario. Uh, there's 492 megawatts DC installed in, in Ontario, more than 10,000 systems, uh, whereas in the rest of Canada, it's about 2 megawatts. So less than 1% actually in the other provinces. Uh, after Ontario, it's a BC that has a 1.2 megawatt, 176 systems interconnected. Alberta has some kind of a, a small, uh, I would say, uh, incentive program put forward by NMAX that installed the 1.3 kilowatt systems on the residential, uh, for uh, residential owners. And uh, you have had some success uh, with this. Uh, but uh, typically in other provinces, we can count the amount of grid connected systems on, on uh, fingers of two hands. Uh, but we, we have to, uh, to put that into perspective, right? 492 is, is a lot, but there's still 2,000 megawatts that's contracted, so that will be built in the next uh, three years. And really, the objective of the Ontario government was not just to add more uh, PV power on, on the network, it, it was this, but the, it, the, the program also uh, finances the uh, wind, the uh, energy, and also the refurbishment of uh, uh, nuclear plants and the installation of uh, natural gas uh, uh, reactors. So really, the aim was to shut down coal plants in Ontario. And to some measure, when we see the success, there have been some announcements that uh, the most polluting coal plants in Ontario are, are being shut down. So there's good progress made towards that achieving that objective. And also another objective was to create jobs within an emerging uh, economy sector. And also we can monitor this report allows to see the progress is made. Okay? Uh, and as of 2011, there were an estimate of 5,143 labor places in, the, in the, this photovoltaic sector. Uh, mainly in the area of construction trade and manufacturing trade. Um, the electricity generated by uh, all systems amounted to uh, an estimate of 704 gigawatt hours, so that could represent a, a value of a 40, about $47 million uh, per year. Now, in the overall scheme of things, PV is still a fraction of the electricity that Canada uses, it is less than 1%. But nevertheless, the growth is definitely there. And the, all the, the, the labor, the, the companies, the manufacturing output uh, came to about $593 million 
dollars. So most of the industrial output at the moment is uh, in Ontario, the manufacturing cap capability, and that's uh, a consequence, I would say, of the, uh, the FIT programs, the incentive programs that required uh, to have a domestic content. So uh, for a project to be compliant with the FIT uh, rules, it had to uh, contain at least 60% or 50% Ontario content, and that has thus stimulated the growth of the uh, industry in Ontario. As we've seen now, the main module manufacturers are well, Canadian Solar, that has now a fabrication plant in, in Ontario, but also is one of the top 10 uh, module manufacturers in the world. It has uh, most of its facilities located in China, but has recently created 300 jobs in uh, Kitchener, Ontario. Uh, Celestica, Hotowa are also a large one. Uh, module is one area, but we also manufacture in the power electronics area. So. Uh, uh, Satcon, Schneider Electric are two big players. And we were talking about uh, Schletter earlier. And there's a Canadian branch uh, to uh, Schletter now in Ontario. So uh, I would say, yeah, most of the uh, players installed in Ontario are presently uh, meeting the demand <coughs> from Ontario and exporting little. But it's not the case of the non Ontario based manufacturers. Uh, and there we talk less, but there's a uh, TV module manufacturer called V4 Energy that's based in, uh, in British Columbia. And uh, also a uh, feedstock supplier, 5N Plus, in, located in Montreal that supplies uh, cadmium telluride to First Solar. It's one of the largest uh, um, cadmium telluride supplier in the world. And that company is established in Montreal and exports uh, more than 95% of its production uh, to uh, outside of Canada. Now, in terms of uh, near-term forecast, what, what can we expect in the, in the PG market over the next few years? Uh, Navigant has looked at uh, the applications right now uh, for the FIT and the ESOP program and took into account that not all uh, 2,000 me megawatts will go forward. Some of those will die from attrition, so they, they put some uh, losses. And also, uh, they kept the uh, grid-connected uh, Deployment outside Ontario at a constant 2 megawatt per year. Our grid uh, capacity deployment at a constant 25 megawatt per year. And we see that over the next three years, we can expect 633 megawatts to be installed this year. Then uh, in 2013, 748 megawatts. And finally, 533 megawatts. So already in 2011, we installed 295 megawatts, and that was the, the, the largest uh, capacity we ever installed in Canada. Well, that's going to double next year and remain at the same level for another two years. So, I mean, all this extra capacity, of course, puts some uh, pressure on the uh, on the workforce and uh, needs. Excuse me. Yes. In the previous uh, chart, you had zero for Ontario uh, Microsoft. Yes. Well, I think the, the main reason for in, in the analysis that Navigant uh, did is that the contracted capacity at the moment in, in the microfit can be installed relatively once the approval are, are obtained. And I think once that's the contracted stage, then it, the approval is, is there. Uh, then it's, that capacity can be installed relatively quickly in a couple of months. So that's why the, it only takes one year to install this. And as to why there's no more after that, um, my interpretation is that uh, at the moment, it's the long-term energy plan of Ontario that sets the, the, the objectives and the limits for in terms of the solar electricity that's going to be installed. And we're very close to reaching the objectives of the long-term energy plan. So if that scenario is kept the same, then we expect that fewer installations will take place. But if there's a re-evaluation of those objectives, and I'm sure that the, that will be part, certainly, uh, of, of the agenda of, of meetings of things to be reevaluated. Then, yes, certainly that capacity could be uh, put more. But for the moment, the assessment is more of a conservative. What's likely to happen in the next three years if nothing uh, changes? So. Right now, I mean, as of 2011, the uh, sector employed about 5,143 uh, labor forces, 
But to meet the installation needs in the next two years, we're going to need 8,956 workers. So there's a shortfall of about 4,000 workers, uh, mainly in the, in the field of uh, manufacturing and in the construction trade. So the, uh, I'm sure the Promise of Ontario will be able to adjust to this, uh, to this demand, but it shows that employment will be uh, even better in, in the coming years in this field. Now, in terms of longer term and medium term uh, market prediction, it, it's hard to say at the moment because there's so many driving forces that operate in, in market. But what we can certainly say is that one uh, positive force will be that the cost of PV system uh, will keep going down while the value of electricity will be going up. And then depending on the, on the different uh, scenarios that, that will happen, depending whether we think it's going to decrease at 5% or 10%. Us, traditionally, we've measured a, a reduction of about 11% per year. So in a case like this, we can expect that by 2019 in Ontario, uh, PV should reach the, the point of grid parity, meaning the, all the electricity that would be generated by a PV system over its lifetime divided by uh, its cost that would be comparable to the value, uh, the market value of the, uh, of the electricity. So that might happen anywhere between 2019 and 2022, uh, according to Navigant. Now that's for the Ontario market. In sunnier regions like Alberta, where there's a bit more sun and where the electricity is costs are also higher, that might happen a bit uh, quicker, more rapidly. And on the other hand, uh, markets where there's less electricity, uh, where there's uh, less sunshine and the electricity costs a bit less, like uh, Quebec, for example, Newfoundland, it might take a couple more years, but nevertheless, the ballpark figure is that between 2018 and 22, we should be close to grid parity. And at that point, then uh, other issues and costs will become more important. The issue of green interconnection. Now, already in Ontario, we're starting to see uh, issues about uh, the 7% penetration limits, me meaning that on certain lines, uh, residential owners cannot get access to uh, connect their uh, grid, uh, their PV system. So the, the, the smart grid and the ability to, uh, to further increase the uh, get penetration of PV on the system will become a challenge that will be uh, fairly relevant. Another thing is that as the, the, the feed-in tariff eventually uh, stops, Right now, there's a bubble around the Ontario market in that there's a domestic content requirement. But once this protected bubble is, is out, then it's going to be a competition between Ontario and the rest of the world, including Germany, the US. Japan has been de developing this technology for the last 30 years, and also against China that has uh, incredibly l low uh, production costs. So in a situation like this, and posing Ma being able to, uh, to set our industry to uh, export will be uh, of a critical importance. And this can be achieved only if the companies can innovate. And that's why innovation is a key aspect. And that's why it's been studied in the report. Really, what's the, we wanted to know what the innovation ecosystem right now in Canada could help the industry. And uh, in order to, to have a good innovation ecosystem, we need to have uh, different elements. Uh, amongst that is companies uh, developing new products, but also want to have access to a, a, a talented pool of individual, uh, also access to uh, knowledge networks to, uh, that are brought by uh, research in institutions, by uh, universities. Uh, we also need access to funding, the uh, highest funding from a government or at some point uh, uh, angel and venture capitalist funding. All these ingredients have to be present in the e ecosystem for it to bring innovation. And once the right ingredients are at the place at the right time, we can sometimes see the, the, uh, the emergence of what's called uh, clusters, of innovation clusters. That is, I would say, a, 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 a group of, uh, of companies, of universities, working together to uh, develop on a common uh, technology. And of course, these clusters go through different phases. Right? At the beginning, when it's just an idea in the lab, it's in the latent phase. Uh, but then it develops into a startup. 
And in that phase, growing from the latent to the developing phase, the students, students like yourself, are uh, play an important role as agents of change, taking the innovation in the university and transferring that in the emerging, in the startup. So you have a, a key role to play in the coming years. And after this stage is, is done, we move to the established company, and then eventually after a number of years that the company has been established, it reaches some kind of other plateau. But uh, already, we can start to identify, we see some fault emerging. Yes, please. Um, can you, I, I don't understand what do you mean by angel investment and champions. Yes, okay, well the term angel investors uh, refers to individuals typically who have uh, money or are looking for uh, investment opportunities and then they will look at the promising companies and, and provide some cash amount that can be used by the company to, uh, fur to further grow, to fund its uh, uh, development, R&D activities uh, in exchange typically for uh, some uh, membership in the company so they will have some shares that are uh, given to the angel investors. The wealthy individuals. Yes, it's typically individuals who are wealthy, but also willing to take higher risk than the banks. Banks tend to be on the more conservative side of things and will only invest once the, the technology has shown some uh, proof of success. But venture capitalists typically they come a, a bit before. And as for champions, well, it's typically an innovator somewhere. It can be uh, a scientist, uh, someone in a company that decides to uh, bring his or her technology forward and is willing to devote the uh, effort to that end. So if we look at the uh, clusters in Canada right now, we can already start to see the emergence of a couple of, uh, of, of clusters uh, in the field of organic tea, for example, with the St. Jean Photochemical, or concentrated TV, organ solar and, and cerium technologies. Uh, feedstock, there's a five and plus, six and silicon, in the power electronics, that's a bit more established, so that's why they're a bit further to the right. Schneider Zentrex is an established company. Uh, module cluster in terms of uh, module development, day four energy and Canadian solar, but uh, that has also developed some building integrated uh, PV solutions and working also with uh, home builders to develop the net zero energy homes. I, the picture I showed you at the beginning of net zero energy. And also smaller applications. We will talk a lot about the, the, the power market, but also, also consumer applications. And Carmana has developed uh, lights for uh, land strips to power LEDs for uh, planes that are landing. So other alternative uh, applications. And finally, a mounting system. So I mean, these companies are listed there because they, they innovate. They apply for uh, um, research funding, and I've received a research report from SDTC, from venture capitalists, and they are working actively with universities. In fact, uh, many of you are, are probably working on some of the, with some of these uh, companies right now, some of their products. And uh, <clears throat> so the other part of the ecosystem are the universities. We're, of course, we are aware of the uh, PD Innovation Network that brings together 15 universities and more than 30 <laughs> Uh, professors, um, but there's actually more groups than that. Uh, last time I did a, a survey of the TV r and in Canada, there were over 100 groups doing research on solar cell. But what I'm pleased to see here is that within the network, there's a high level of collaboration, of exchange, of creativity. Also, uh, I look at the, the, what's developed, uh, what's brought forward by, by the students, and uh, I think this is very positive for the future of, uh, of the industry. The PV Innovation Network is one answer to the network. There's also another one that deals with the uh, Smart Net Zero Energy Buildings Network that was approved uh, last year. That's going to last for the next five years. It's also funded by answer, $1 million per year. And its, it's goal is to do research that will uh, facilitate the adoption of net zero energy buildings uh, in Canada by 2030. So, uh, and as I mentioned, net zero energy buildings are buildings that use as much energy as they uh, generate with, from renewable energy sources during a year. It's all about uh, the integration of uh, all elements, a good insulation, uh, solar passive, geothermal. So uh, really, it's, uh, it's by efficiently integrating all these, these different uh, energy and concepts that we can reach this old. So there's a different themes here in our study. 
uh, integration of renewable energy and heating cooling systems, dynamic building envelope systems, the envelope is crucial to reach uh, these goals. Uh, mid to long term thermal storage, okay? because for example, sunshine, we get it a lot in the summer, the hours, the daylight hours are long, but sometimes uh, we need uh, to store this uh, energy, so storage is also uh, another aspect that's studied in the network. Smart building operating strategies, how to reduce the peaks of the utilities, so uh, that could be another advantage of PV because the production, the resource is there, and in Ontario especially, it's correlated with the uh, peaks for uh, cooling of buildings, so there's perhaps some, uh, some uh, good points there, winning points that uh, PV can, uh, can bring for uh, utilities, and finally some uh, design tools and uh, input to national policy. So that's another network. I, I could actually speak about another network that's not directly related to PV, the Smart Grid Research Network, but that will uh, nevertheless is, is key to facilitate the integration of PV to the electric network. As I was mentioning, it's going to become uh, an issue that's more and more important. So universities, uh, companies, they play a, an important role in the innovation system. And our program is also part of the uh, uh, ecosystem. Our work tends to be more downstream. Uh, our research work deals more with, let's say, keeping the performance and the safety standards up to date so that there's no barriers uh, with regards to their integration on houses and on the grid. So that's something that we really do. Uh, also, I was mentioning the high penetration issue. So we do a research with uh, utilities and with a different organization in finding solutions to move this 7% limit that's uh, enforced by Ontario Hydro at the moment to other limits such as 30% that we commonly see in Germany and in Denmark that uh, are uh, markets that have uh, more uh, PV uh, integrated. So finding solutions on these issues is important. Uh, we also look at how to improve the performance of large utility scale systems, building integrated systems, how to get a better value for the same amount of kilowatt uh, power install capacity, working on the optimization of net zero energy homes with the solar building the research network. And finally, uh, I want to, to point out that there will be a new study uh, that will be published by Environment Canada. We collaborated over the last year on health and safety impacts of PV, so studying issues such as life cycle costs uh, of uh, PV electricity. Uh, also, there were some mention of uh, the cadmium telluride uh, issues. Well, that has been the, the literature review has been done by Environment Canada, and we also uh, collaborated to provide some input in that study. And it will be uh, published in, in the coming uh, weeks. So if I'm to uh, summarize all that I've mentioned today, eh, the, the, the PV market at the moment in Canada is, is thriving, it's growing, and in part thanks to the uh, Ontario uh, Power Authority that's put programs into place, but also because we're seeing a good factor, the cost of the technology that's coming down uh, even faster. Uh, typically in Canada right now we're present in along all the supply chain, but mainly in the distribution development and the latter phase phase of the market. Uh, thanks to the, the, the program, we now started to establish presence in the racking, inverter, and module manufacturing. Uh, but we're very there's very little presence in the wafer uh, in the wafer chain of, of the chain. And typically that component is. Uh, it's contracted out. Okay? We import the cells from other uh, from other countries. Even though we have quite a bit of uh, expertise now, uh, a lot of research innovation is now at the cell module and inverter uh, uh, level. Uh, now, one strategy adopted, as we saw this morning, a, uh, by uh, a presenter, Alex, is the strategy to go for vertical integration to uh, get more uh, profit margin. So uh, we're seeing this too. I mean, producers are also becoming installer. Canadian Solar Solutions is one example. Um, now all these installations are putting pressure on the uh, on the uh, the full-time employment, on the demand for a qualified uh, workforce, and we're going to have a shortage in the next two three years. So there's going to be more jobs created. Uh, however, after some time. 
we need to be able to start not only supplying our own uh, market, but be able to export to other markets that are also uh, requiring uh, PV. And in order to do this, in order to uh, export and keep our economic output that's becoming important, we'll need the input from the networks, from the universities, from the innovation capacity, and uh, we also need uh, funding support from the federal and provincial organizations, and also from the uh, 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 private sector to invest and to uh, better be able to compete in an international market. So uh, on this, that summarizes the uh, PV market uh, sector profile. Uh, the report, as I mentioned at the beginning, for those of you who had a hard time uh, uh, fighting the after lunch nap, although I didn't see too many casualties. Uh, people were fairly awake, but if you want to get more detail, uh, so you can go on the internet and uh, pick up the report and it's a free of charge. Thank you for your attention. Um, maybe a, a tiny question. Do you have any opinion on the rumors of some countries uh, wanting to sue Ontario for their uh, microfit program? Yes, so I'll repeat the question <coughs> for the of the audience. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a domestic content to the, uh, to the uh, program put uh, in place by the government of Ontario. And that domestic content, that's protectionism, uh, strategy has been uh, contested by countries like Japan, and now the European Union is also joining the, this, uh, this uh, fight. Uh, from what I heard, that started about two years ago. Uh, from what I heard, there's you know, talks uh, at the le legal level, and what I was uh, told, what I heard is that um, right now the position of Canada is that uh, electricity is really a provincial jurisdiction, so really, the, the, the pursuit the, the, by other countries against Canada regarding the, the Ontario program is not really applicable because the federal government doesn't have the say in two-party provincial uh, jurisdiction. Now, I don't know uh, if, uh, if that's uh, good enough uh, defense. Uh, I don't know if they can <laughs> in turn, uh, turn to Ontario and sue Ontario, but uh, I don't want I heard that there's discussions uh, at, at that level and it's really a, a larger battle. It's hard to say what's going to be the outcome of this. Uh, we're following this, and uh, we'll hear more. But it's at that stage uh, right now. Compared to Germany, of course, in Ontario, we're really at the beginning of the implementation of PV. Uh, really, uh, I mean, PV, the, the intermittency of, of wind and PV starts to become a problem once we reach penetration rate of about 30%. The, the grid can accommodate some forms of fluctuations and can deal with these uh, fluctuations uh, through different strategies. But once we reach that 30% limit, then there needs to be more thought into how do we operate the network. I mean, uh, some solutions would be to put uh, more generation capacity that can be turned on and off quickly on the network. And some people have argued that this will lead to more natural gas capacity installed. That's one solution. It might not be the best solution. Another solution is to deal with storage. And uh, now there's different ways. I believe in Germany, there's actually some uh, tariffs. If you can prove that you, the electricity was uh, generated, was, uh, that's generated by PV modules, if you can prove that it was used by the home house instead of sent to the grid, you get a higher uh, feed-in tariff. Uh, so there can be then some strategies implemented in the house to either store it or use it more. 
Uh, so we're thinking about, uh, okay, now there's an electric car that's just starting, but maybe in 10 years from now, there will be enough electric cars that we can use their used batteries, and it won't be, it won't be good enough for a car, for cars anymore, but it might be good enough to store part of the uh, gas as storage and thus smoothen out these variations. And a, a third way, aside from storage, that's sometimes costly, there's also demand, demand side management. Eh? The, the, the resource fluctuates, well, why not fluctuate the load as well? And that's where the research on the smart grid is, will be of critical importance because if we have, let's say, a community of uh, uh, water heaters or a community of electric cars being charged at the moment, and some of these charges are already close to 100%, the water is almost at 60 degrees, and perhaps we can turn off some of these water heaters, let's say 20% up, to accommodate the fact that the supply on the grid right now is a bit at a lower position. So there's all kinds of strategies like this that will need to be developed. As I mentioned, the, the energy sector is really a, a provincial jurisdiction. Uh, in Quebec, there's nothing like this really. It's always uh, it's a flat rate for the first 30 kilowatt hours, and then a, a second rate for the next 30 for the all other kilowatt hours, at least in the residential sectors. In the industry sector, they play a, a flat rate, but uh, they have to take uh, to worry about the, the power peaks. Uh, this in Ontario, there is a time of day uh, pricing. And, but that's for the industry sector. Okay. For the uh, homeowners, they don't have the, I would say, time of you, you do now? You, okay. Okay, so, but I would say that people are moving more and more towards time of day pricing because it's a constraint on the utility. If the utility has to uh, put, put on the network extra uh, generating uh, capacities, really, and that are not often used, there's an extra cost to this. So I would say now with the intelligence embedded in these smart meters, will be moving more and more towards the, the smart grid in time of the uh, use pricing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was wondering if you, what the status on electric vehicles are. Like, is there a reasonable, is it reasonable to think that 10 years from now we'll start seeing them on the roads? Um, well, I guess we'll have to see. It's something new right now. Uh, I mean, the, the, I think the issue with the electric cars right now is that they're somewhat uh, not affordable and they're rather pricey. And uh, really, the people who are buying electric cars right now, maybe they don't worry that much about uh, uh, cost effectiveness. But as the car manufacturers, if they manage to bring down the price of batteries, extend and extend their, their range, so bring down, the offer let's say, solutions that are more afforda affordable for the, the mass of consumer. I'm personally convinced that that will uh, actually get a, a great buy-in from the community. Uh, I personally purchased an electric car a month ago, and what I can say as the preliminary results is that when I uh, drive on electricity, it, it costs me five times less uh, than driving on oil. And since uh, I also have a PV system on my house while well, sometimes I drive on solar electricity. So what can be better than driving on solar energy? And what's even nice, nicer when you do the calculations is that at a price of $6 per watt, it's actually cheaper than to drive on solar electricity than driving on petroleum. So with these advantages, then I can only see a bright future for the electric car. Uh, so do you see the federal government consolidating The provinces would not uh, let the, the federal do this. It's it's, it's a domain of a, a provincial power, and you know it's, it's it's commonly agreed. And I don't. It's not definitely not in the strategy of the federal government to take back that that power. That will lead to a lot of uh, disagreement among the province. And really, uh, trying to do a national policy on energy is something that was attempted before and that didn't turn out too well. So at the moment, at least, uh, 
there's some uh, trials to, to facilitate the exchange uh, of uh, electricity with uh, other countries, with uh, the US, for example. But uh, for the rest, interprovincial trade is something that's uh, actually part of the, should be part of the uh, provincial uh, strategy. And that's sometimes not as easy to implement as it should. to know more about uh, the, the, the constraints you're referring to because we actually have in the uh, Canadian Electrical Code all the installation uh, procedures for safety is all uh, set already and we have uh, standards for inverters regarding the interconnection. There's standards also for uh, not only products but also for the interconnection uh, capabilities. So uh, I was wondering did you have a specific constraint in mind that you uh, The one that I faced recently mm -hmm. that we put my actually is the UL so when it comes to building integration, we need frameless release, but we cannot use frameless release because they're not certified. Yes. Right. Well, I'm, I'm well placed to comment on this because I'm on the uh, working group that develops international standards for PV modules. And the thing is, uh, when you have a module that has a frame, it has some uh, rigidity. And we heard that also this morning that it, it's easier to handle. But once you remove this frame, the module uh, doesn't uh, have as good mechanical uh, stability properties. So because of this, then most modules typically fail some of the tests, the structural evaluation tests. So uh, th I think the, the challenge is to come up with a product that will ensure good me mechanical integrity of the whole array itself. Uh, perhaps then, then there can be a, a standard that addresses the, uh, I would say, the PV array uh, stability. Uh, there needs to be some, uh, something developed. But that's why, I mean, uh, standard development always evolves. As the technology evolves, the, the measuring procedures evolve, we need to develop new standards to address new needs, but also uh, uh, keep them in line with uh, the innovation in the field. So that's, uh, yeah, at the moment, there's no precise uh, project on this, but as new products uh, arrive on the market, that's an issue that will be uh, dealt with in, in the standard development organization. Okay, last question. Yeah, could you expand a little bit more on that 7% limit you mentioned? So mm -hmm. how does that work exactly? Okay, for, for large uh, PV systems, megawatt scale uh, systems, the, 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 the system interconnects to the transmission line. And there's, if there's enough capacity, there, then typically the, the, the farm is given access but for the distribution uh, uh, network, then uh, Ontario Hydro has uh, limited the uh, capacity that you can integrate on the line to a certain level of minimum load. Because of course, I mean, the network always has to be able to meet the demand of the load connected to it, but also the supply uh, has to find a load because you cannot, do, you cannot store electricity as a, unless you have batteries. You need to be able to do something with the power and in some cases, then it can uh, be an issue for lines where there's not too much load on the line. Uh, if there's too much generation there, then that could uh, set uh, problems with the uh, uh, protection mechanisms uh, of the network on the feeder station. So that's why to make sure that uh, there's, it doesn't pose a, a risk of integrity or safety on the network, uh, Ontario Hydro has set a, a limit of 7%. But that's only Ontario Hydro. The other utilities in Ontario presently are perhaps facing less uh, uh, stringent problems and don't apply this rule. And that's why uh, now there, is, there needs to be work uh, done with the utilities, uh, studies done on, on real systems to show really what's the real impact of having a voltage uh, a differences, voltage uh, variations, and what other solutions what solutions were put forward by other countries like Germany, Denmark, that can uh, achieve a 30% penetration rate without uh, problems on their network? Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank 